almost forgot it was my turn to get up. I was getting a little caught up in the <laughs> in the music there. Thank you. I have been participating recently in a book club that um, Prescott Isle Adult Ed has. They're doing some book discussions on books that have been banned, which I always find interesting and intriguing. So um, I've done a couple. And the one that we read this month is this one called The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexi. Um, it's a young adult novel, fictional, so the absolutely true part isn't, you know, absolutely true, if you get what I mean. But um, but it's a great read, and it, it is incredibly thought-provoking. Um, and in it, the protagonist in the book is named Albert. Um, and Albert is this really scrawny kid with a big head, and he was born with water on the brain, which left him susceptible to seizures for a long time when he was young. And, and one eye is very nearsighted and the other eye is very farsighted. And so he has these really lopsided glasses. And because he's poor and he lives on the Spokane Indian Reservation, the glasses that he has are also those big, thick, ugly black frames. And, and he had... He was born with 42 teeth, which, as you may or may not know, is 10 too many. And so he gets to the point where he can barely close his mouth, and he's kind of a slobbery eater and all that kind of stuff. And But because the, the Indian health services will only pay for um, dental care once a year, he has to have all 10 pulled out at once. And because the white dentist on the reservation believes that Indians are um, higher, have a higher pain tolerance than whites. He only uses half of the Novocaine when he takes out those 10 extra teeth. And, and so he's got a lisp and a stutter, and he's definitely part of the Black Eye of the Month Club. Because see, on the reservation, the unwritten rules are that uh, rule number one, if somebody insults you, you have to fight them. And rule number two is if you think somebody's going to insult you, then you have to fight them. And if somebody insults any of your family or your friends or you think they're going to insult your family or friends or if you think they're thinking about insulting your family or friends, then you have to fight them. You get the idea, right? And, and Albert is clearly a, a nerd and he's scrawny and he just doesn't fit in. And so he gets picked on a lot. But the thing is that Albert's smart, which doesn't make any sense because given the water on the brain and the seizures and all of that sort of thing, he's not supposed to be smart. But somehow, against all odds, he's ended up actually pretty intelligent and he likes books, which is one of the reasons he gets beat up all the time. <laughs> so Albert turns 14, the first day of high school, and he's excited, which means he's going to get beat up because <laughs> he's excited about school. And he's particularly excited about geometry. He's, he's really excited. He gets abnormally excited about isosceles triangles. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so he's going into what he's ready for his favorite class on the first day of high school. And in walks Mr. P with this tote full of geometry textbooks. And Mr. P is a weird old coot. Mr. P has been teaching at the school for a really long time, and sometimes he shows up at school in his pajamas and his slippers, not because it's some fun, like, spirit day, but just because he's kind of absent-minded and he overslept or he forgot. Sometimes he even forgets to show up for school, and he lives in a trailer right behind the school <laughs> because in order to teach on the res, you actually have to live on the compound, and so... He's lived in this old trailer behind the school for decades. And sometimes he just oversleeps and forgets that he's supposed to show up and teach that day. But to be fair, most of the kids actually think he's just fine because he doesn't have very high expectations. I mean, how high can your expectations be if you sometimes don't show up to school yourself? And if you do show up, you're in pajamas and slippers. Like, he's not really, you know can't really live up to, to that. But, but Albert 
is, is smart and he wants to learn, and he especially wants to learn geometry. And so when he opens up this textbook that Mr. P gives him out of this tote, and he flips through and he sees on the beginning of the book his mother's name, his mother's maiden name. And he knows that his mother had to be at least 30 when, he, when she had him. And he sees his mother's name in that old, 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 decrepit geometry textbook. And all the frustration and the disappointment and the pain of living in poverty and the hopelessness of life and education on the reservation. And now all of that just boils over. And he takes that geometry textbook, and it fl flies through the air hard and fast and straight into the large, hairy nostril nose of Mr. P. And Albert gets suspended. And all those dreams of an education and being all excited about the isosceles triangles, and it's gone. So he goes home and he's he's sitting on the front step. And about a week into his suspension, up walks Mr. P. And now based on Albert's life experience to date, he's pretty sure that Mr. P might not want to kill him, but would be okay if he was dead. And at the very least, Albert expects to be going to jail any day. But Mr. P instead comes up and he kind of sits down beside him, and he's just kind of quiet for a while, for so long that the silence almost gets to be this third character <laughs> sitting there on the step with him. And, and then Mr. P just kind of starts talking, and they have this conversation, and Mr. P tells Albert things about his sister that he didn't know, and things about Mr. P that he didn't know. And at some point in that conversation, Mr. P says, you are a bright and shining star. You're the smartest kid in school, and I don't want you to fail. I don't want you to fade away. You deserve better. I want you to say it. Say what? I want you to say that you deserve better. And Albert's mind starts to spiral because he thinks, I couldn't say that. It wasn't true. I mean, I wanted to have it better, but I didn't deserve it. I was the kid who threw books at teachers. But Mr. P interrupted his thoughts. You're a good kid. You deserve better. You deserve the world. See, Mr. P sees something in Albert that Albert can't see in himself. He doesn't have any life experience other than getting beat up, trying to defend himself, throw the first punch because it's the only one you're going to get. He gets to the point where he internalizes all of the I'm a dork, you know, I'm stupid, all of the all of the teasing and the negativity that he's gotten over his whole life. That's that's how he defines himself. And so he's never heard this other perspective and he doesn't really know what to do with it. But Mr. P sees something in Albert and doesn't just see it but actually expresses it. Tells Albert what he sees. So ultimately, Albert transfers to a white school, hence the part-time Indian in the title, and there he learns that there's this different world where people live by different rules, where he throws a punch and he doesn't get beat up in return. Now, the whole story is problematic. <laughs> uh, some white savior mentality kind of stuff going on, and it's an excellent read specifically for those kind of thought-provoking um, conversations. Makes for great reflection. But today's scripture reading 
takes us back. By now in the liturgical year, we've long since forgotten about Mary and Joseph. We're moving into an adult Jesus now, and in the blink of an eye, we're going to be into uh, a Lenten season, getting ready for the murder of Jesus. And this reading takes us back for a hot minute to remember the young family, the infant Jesus when they've gone back to the temple for circumcision, presentation. So Jesus is only a week old. And at this stage of the narrative, Mary and Joseph are still this shunned, shamed young couple. Harken back to the season of Advent when this unwed woman is pregnant when Joseph, the, the righteous man, chooses not to have her stoned to death as was the law, but instead dares to take her into his home. These parents are still cloaked in shame at this point. You have to wonder if they're going into the temple thinking, oh, crud. I mean, we're going to do it because we're faithful and we got to do it, but how many looks are we going to have to endure when we go into the temple? Maybe we can kind of sneak in and just walk real low under the radar and, and not have to deal with Aunt Susie's second cousin thrice removed, who you know she's done nothing but talk about us for several months now. And still they go, and, and they dare, <laughs> and they take the poor family's offering. The law is kind enough to accommodate people in poverty with a, a smaller amount that they have to take to sacrifice in order to purify Mary after childbirth. And so they go to be faithful, even in the midst of a culture that is not really all that supportive. And they meet Simeon and Anna. They meet these two elders and receive, instead of shame and shun, they receive blessing. I mean, most of the time when we read the scripture that Kiman so eloquently read for us, most of the time we focus on the things that Simeon and Anna see and their message for and about the Christ child. And that's, that's all true and good. But Simeon blesses Mary and Joseph. This young couple that has been shunned and experiencing shame and Simeon blesses them. And Anna speaks about the child, yes, but she speaks about the child to the rest of community, to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And you wonder if at some point she didn't have people going, wait, what? That kid? I mean, I'm pretty sure I heard some sketchy things about Mary and Joseph. And yet Anna says, yeah, <laughs> w whatever. <laughs> maybe you heard something, maybe you didn't, but I'm here to tell you that that child, that family is the source of redemption. Luke's gospel reminds us of the importance of elders in the faith the critical role that women have to play throughout scripture and the constant presence and work of the spirit in and among those whom society would shun. Simeon and Anna have devoted their lives to faithful service and they see the child for who the child is and they see the parents for who they are and they bless them offering them standing in the community, offering them hope and the community around them hope. Now, Mr. P is nowhere near as righteous as Simeon and Anna. <laughs> Mr. P is a, a deeply problematic and troubled character. 
And even Mr. P finds some redemption by speaking hope to one who is shunned. So what does that have to do with any of us? <laughs> well, have you ever seen a parent struggling with a screaming child? <laughs> Have you ever heard people talking about a family? You know, they, they got divorced. Isn't that terrible for the children? I heard she was sleeping around. What about that poor child? Well, maybe those are the times that we are called to speak blessing. Maybe those are the times we are called to remind people how God works in and through, especially those that others would shun. Have you ever looked at a child or a teen and thought, it's such a shame. That poor kid doesn't have a prayer. Their family's poor. They're doing poorly in school. The brother's in jail. It's a bright kid, but just doesn't have a prayer. Maybe? Just maybe you're the prayer. <laughs>